Lift Fit Podcast, episode 134, Hormone Therapy with Justine Cecile. Mostly, I work with women who feel hormonal. You know, they have perimenopause or menopausal symptoms, even though they're on hormone therapy. So they're not things just aren't working. The big thing with fibromyalgia is going to always be um, working with stress and diet in particular and movement. And there's just lifestyle things so that you can control it um, and ease it. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with Glenn Johnson, your resource for all things that contribute to good health. You will hear expert advice and interviews with leading authorities on fitness, food, fat loss, mindset, and the mind-body connection. You will find show notes, articles, and health programs at livefitpodcast.com. Ah, uh, yes, it is time once again for the Live Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Johnson, your guide to better health. Ah, oh, I feel so good right now. Fresh, clean, young, and alive. I just shaved a beard that I've been wearing since the very beginning of July. I had no idea how good this would feel. I went on vacation in July and, like most guys, didn't shave. I got back and thought, yeah, let's let this ride and see what happens. And people liked it. I liked it. My family liked it. So I kept it going. A couple months into it, starting to get a little tired of it. But then I thought I might as well keep this for a Halloween costume. You see, a few years ago, a friend of mine said, Hey, Glenn, if you had a beard, you'd look just like Captain Obvious. And I said, well, who the heck is that? So I looked him up and thought, oh, yeah, there is a, quite a resemblance in the personality as well, too. So uh, I kept it going and decided that was going to be my Halloween costume and pulled it off beautifully. I, I loved it. I thought I looked pretty good. A lot of people uh, also commented on it, and uh, it was fun. And then I'm like, all right, how long am I going to keep this thing now? So Halloween is the day this is being released. So it's not yet Halloween, but I went to a party and showed it off. So I surprised myself, shaved it. I was so excited. I felt so good. I was dancing in the shower. I swear I took 20 years off me. Now, I'm not saying beards are bad, but this one... I liked it in a way, but it also made me look and look old, and it just made me feel a little bit kind of scruffy, I guess you could say, even though it was uh, well well groomed. Ha! <sighs> it was good to have a beard for a while, and it's even better to have it off. So, in other words, change or variety is the spice of life. Today's guest is Justine Cecile. She is a hormone therapist, or for all you technically inclined people a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. She specializes in menopausal women to help them overcome the chaos of raging hormones. Yet, she is well-equipped to handle women and men of any age. After decades of hormonal and neurotransmitter imbalances, Cecile discovered functional medicine. Now, her work is based on a highly potent blend of a functional health approach, state-of-the-art diagnostics, behavioral neuroscience, NLP, and almost 25 years of experience with living with out-of-control hormones and learning how to balance them naturally through targeted supplementation, diet, and restructuring her lifestyle to create a full and active life that she now loves. If you're listening to this show, which I know you are, you must care about your health. Guess what? I also care about your health. And in fact, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing what I do, because I really, really, really want you to live a life that is healthy, fit, and free of preventable diseases. To do that, I need to know what I can do for you. What subjects do you want to know more about? What services can I provide? To do this, I have a really simple, quick, three-question survey located at livefitsurvey.com. That's livefitsurvey.com. It's a real easy name to remember. You're listening to the Live Fit Podcast. Show notes are available at livefitpodcast.com. Now you can answer three simple questions. How can I help you? 
liftfitsurvey.com. I know I'm being very re repetitive, but that's because people can remember things when they've heard liftfitsurvey.com multiple times. I know most of you are probably driving, biking, working out, mowing the lawn, whatever you might be doing, and you may not be able to type in liftfitsurvey.com into your phone or other computer. So when you have a chance, make a mental note. As soon as you get in front of a computer or a smartphone and you're not driving, type in livefitsurvey.com. Answer those simple three questions on how I can help you more. Now, let's have a chat with Justine Cecile. Hi, Justine. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's, um, it's a beautiful day. Uh, we actually have our summer finally. Can you give uh, myself and my listeners a brief bio of what you do and why you do it? Yeah. Um, well, my name is Justine Cecile. For those of you who, who, who don't know me, I am a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, but that wasn't always uh, what I was. I started off going in the veterinary route. So I've always been into science and biology and so forth. But in order to um, pay for veterinary school, which I would have done at been Corvallis, Oregon, actually, I, I started school up there. I just couldn't afford it because it was out of state fees. And yeah. um, But it, I joined the military. And I actually really, really, I, yeah. And I... I really loved it. I didn't expect to. Um, I was in the veterinary corps, but I was a food inspector, and I was always in the field, and I really got to do some very interesting things. I worked with refugees and um, just some really, really great things because I was always on the um, uh, peacekeeping side of the house, if you will. So I, I really, really enjoyed it. But um, my body started to break down. I was um, started to freeze up and things, and I ended up being discharged from the military. I was a E7 uh, in charge of troops going in and out of Bosnia, but I I couldn't function. I wasn't really deployable anymore. So basically, it turned out I, I was discharged and and you know disabled veteran, and. Um, Stanford decided I had fibromyalgia. So I'd always had hormone problems, though, up until uh, this point. I had a lot of um, hormone therapy back and forth, just a lot of issues. And then the fibromyalgia kicked in. And both hormones and fibromyalgia are kind of centered around the hypothalamus. So it's kind of an interesting thing. So there wasn't really any help for me back then. This was back in 2001, and they knew a lot less about fibro than they know today, and they still don't know anything. Can you, and, can you tell us a little bit about what fibromyalgia is for the listeners that aren't quite sure? Sure. So the, the name fibromyalgia implies that it's muscle pain, but it, it's actually not centered about, around that. It's more of a nervous um, system disorder. They just, we don't know exactly what the epidus is of it, right? Yeah. But there's a lot of research pointing to um, the hypothalamus and different signaling. It looks to be genetically predisposed, but it doesn't have to express itself. It needs to have kind of, you need to have a weakened immune system. You have to have prolonged stress. You have to have traumatic events, a bunch of things to kind of flip it on. Mm -hmm. um, so the environment needs to be a certain way in order for the gene to express itself. And then once you have it, uh, the problem is, is that because it's, it's affecting the nervous system and the hypothalamus, it really can cause, um, it's kind of the queen bee of metabolic chaos, if you will. So you know, there's a million symptoms that show up with it, but the problem is, is those are symptoms. Those aren't the actual um, condition itself. Yes. You know, those are symptoms from everything going awry. So it gets kind of confusing for individuals with fibro, but it's it can be very painful. It can be incredibly yeah. debilitating. Um, in my own case, I'm not symptomatic really anymore, though I still have to be cautious um, that I don't 
trip myself up, but your nervous system, your sensory system is very hyper aware. So people have problems with smells, lights, sights, cool breezes, temperature regulation, you know, the Mm -hmm. taste, all different kinds of things can um, aggravate, you know, your nervous system because the sensory system is pretty, a lot more aware. There are some physiological changes as well. Um, There's like high P factor in your spinal fluid, which is kind of a a pain. It's a chemical that helps trans, uh, helps the pain signal, you know, go around. So then we'll feel more again. But a lot of the muscle (laughs) pain is muscle tiredness. It's, it's weak. It's not necessarily weak, but they're so tired from being tense. Or the feeling of fatigue. Yeah. So they get very exhausted and your muscles will really burn and hurt. Um, You get tender points, you get trigger points, really hard muscle cramping, that can cause your connective tissue to get dehydrated and really um, constricted and tight. You get a lot of neuropathy. Um, I had a lot of neuropathy issues. Um, Your balance can go. And you say this is really the root cause it are our hormones. Is that the cause or the, like the secondary result? No, I wouldn't say it was hormones. So I I need to be careful with this. We don't really know the cause of it. Um, It looks like there's a genetic predisposition because there are some real physiological abnormalities that come with it, um, real chemical changes, but it looks to be centered around the hypothalamus, like something in there. And remember, the hypothalamus also talks to you know, your pituitary, your adrenals, your thyroid, your gonads. So it, it's going to be, they're very much associated, but I cannot tell you that that's what it is because nobody really knows. Um, But the problem though, is even if it didn't have anything to do with the hypothalamus, the amount of stress that's caused by fibromyalgia and the nervous system, that's going to affect your stress response system regardless. Mm. So there's always going to be hormones. So you work with people who suffer from fibromyalgia. What are some of the other complaints that people come to you with? Mostly I work with women who feel hormonal. You know, they have perimenopause or menopausal symptoms, even though they're on hormone therapy. So they're not, things just aren't working. You know, they're feeling anxiety. They still have excessive night sweats and, and, you know, hot flashes. A lot of the women that I work with, you know, they're working and they're trying to be taken seriously, which women will tell you is hard to do sometimes, right, normally. But then when you break out in a sweat right in the middle of a presentation or you're feeling anxious, um, it can cause, it can make that a lot harder for people. But when you're hormonal... And I don't mean to say that like PMS or something, but when your hormones are just all over the place, one minute you can be happy, you could be sad, you could you could just get angry for no reason at all. And you, you can't really control those emotions. It's very difficult to do. So that's who the majority of people I see are women who are in that that sphere. Um, though I do work with people with fibromyalgia and stuff, but fibromyalgia is pretty big. Um, so we tend to focus on it small increments and work just to kind of relieve those symptoms. And then the big thing with fibromyalgia is going to always be um, working with stress and diet in particular and movement. And there's just lifestyle things so that you can control it um, and ease it. I, I'm not very symptomatic myself, but I still have to watch those things. And um I'm not sure we can cure it because I don't. I'm not sure we can ever get the environment um, around us to the perfect place in order to switch the gene back off, if you will. Right. So, um, but I work with, you know, I've, I I have a young man who's in college who suffers with anxiety and and um, his stress response system is overactive and stuff. So I'm working with him as well. So. Basically, anything that has to do with hormones, but predominantly older women, um, 45, 
who are hitting the perimenopause area, menopause. Well, tell me how you how do you treat these people? You you can't just look at them and listen to them and maybe you know touch them and determine uh-huh. what the root cause is. So how are you coming up with this information for your treatment? Well, it's kind of twofold. It's um, So when I initially speak with somebody, I can kind of get a feel for things. I, I have a, a health history that they fill out and and then we'll, we'll chat. And I can kind of get a feel for what their life is like. And there are seven primary root causes. So I can you know, get a sense. But to really determine what those causes are when we start working together, I have them fill out assessment forms and unfortunately they're pretty in depth so they take a little while. But then I have a really long conversation. It's not just about what's going on right now. It could be trauma that they used to have. Um, You know, there are people's histories, you know, how, how they ate in college, how they've handled stress their whole life, how they've uh, lived their whole life, how they re- react and respond. You really want to take a look at a big picture of their symptomatic, you know, what's gone on through their life pretty much. Yeah. And then in addition to that, I do diagnostics. But I do the diagnostics um, pretty much after I have a sense of where we're going because I don't want people to take the wrong test. I want to try and pinpoint the biggest opportunity, you know, for us to find what's kind of going on. But lab testing is great. You you kind of need it to really confirm things, but it's still yeah. a moment in time. So that health history and really getting in depth and taking your time to go through um, a person's life and, and their symptoms and how things showed up uh, really is they go together. You can't do one without the other. It's really um, the problem with Western medicine often is is people do tests and then they treat the test results. But that's not the big picture. That's just a moment in time. And so it could help relieve a symptom, but it's not correcting the dysfunction uh, very, very rarely. Now, speaking of your moment in time mm-hmm. testing, uh, which is how Western medicine does it, and and you said mm-hmm. that's how you do it as well, is there uh, a better way, perhaps maybe taking three tests in a day or three tests in a week or in a month or something like that? Um, well, you, you can do that, but that can be expensive and, uh, you know, unnecessary if you just work together with the health history. The one test, though, that I do do that I I do over time is cortisol, which is your um, one of your primary stress response hormones. Yes. And the reason why I test that over time is because that's a good indicator for a person's um, circadian rhythm and how they're, you know, functioning throughout a day. So I might do their a couple of them really early in the morning to see how they. Um, you know, how they wake up because that's when your cortisol should naturally rise the highest. And then it should fall at a, you know, at a nice gentle slope all the way to the evening. And this is where it switches with melatonin at this point so that people can kind of go to sleep. But you want a total view of how much cortisol is out there. You also want to look at, so Some people do saliva, some people do blood serum, and I do a urine test. And the reason why I use urine for these is because I want to see the metabolites as well as the free cortisol, because Uh that gives me a better indication as to whether one, the adrenal glands, if they're able to produce enough, um, but also if the body's able to use the cortisol and, you know, because there are issues if it's not able to use it. It could be producing it, but it might not be able to use it. And so you want to take a look at that whole picture. So when I'm looking at the stress response system, um, I am going to look at multiple data points throughout the day to get a sense of how the person um, is responding and how that works all together with the circadian rhythms. And and that's going to give us a better idea of, of what's going on there. There's a lot of information that can come out of that. When I work with a a patient, a client, whatever you want to call them, as a health coach, Uh 
and they want to lose weight, I right. first talk to them about their eating, and then we talk about their physical activity level. And then I talk uh -huh. to them about stress, and, and I call that the body weight triangle because mm -hmm. I really do feel that the foundation of a person's body weight is resting on their stress. Their, you know, in, in other words, if they have chronic yeah. stress, which could be caused by poor sleep, it could be caused by many other things. And the main right. you know, reason that is a problem is because of this hormone called cortisol. Now, mm -hmm. I'm just guessing based on what I'm talking uh, w with my conversation with them, and I will give them some stress relieving techniques, tools, and talk to them over time. And they generally do get better. And we, I generally see their weight go down if they are truly following uh, these steps on a regular and consistent basis, pretty much daily. They right. have to keep their stress down. Now, is there something that you what would you do in just in the in the similar scenario that I just gave you if somebody is overweight can't lose the weight they're they're eating and I'll say air quotes here impeccably and they're mm -hmm. at a at a really healthy activity level meaning they're not overdoing it they're not neurotic about it they're not you know obsessed with exercise right, but right. they're they're active every day throughout the day maybe they even you know mix it up do weight training on mondays and a dance class on tuesdays etc mm -hmm. and they're getting good sleep right. but maybe their cortisol is high what would you what would you right. do with them okay so before i begin one thing i want to say is is the point you just made about the type of exercise that they're doing that's critical yeah. you know a lot of people over exercise or they stress out over it and and they're not enjoying it and that's yeah. gonna cause that's actually going to backfire on them so i'm really glad that you mentioned that um so if their cortisol is high the thing about cortisol so metabolism is, is what we really want to look at, right? So metabolism yeah. is going to help them be more efficient and, and therefore use some of their fat for fuel, right? Which is what we want to do to release it. Absolutely. The thing, the thing is, is that's going to be more controlled by thyroid hormone. So the thyroid hormone is actually talking to your mitochondria if you think about it. Because your mitochondria are your powerhouses. This is where your energy is coming from. Yep. However, thyroid has to sit in cell receptors of a cell, um, but cortisol likes those same cell receptors. So if a person is really stressed out, um, thyroid might be just fine, but it's going to be competing with the cortisol. So really what we want to do is we want to do stress management. If cortisol is truly high, so the adrenal glands are really pumping it out and they're not exhausted, right? The hypothalamus pituitary adrenal pathway is working fine and it really is, um, you know, working and functioning. We want to lower it. So that means detoxification, the, the, um, we want to have them sweat. We want to have them basically metabolize and release those cortisol thing, uh, hormones. We also want to make sure you're exercising because exercising is going to help metabolize those hormones. You've already talked about that. Mm -hmm. But really, they have to work on their stress reduction. So they're, they're, they're not, they're not, um, their internal dialogue might be off. Right, they might be really hard on themselves, it's even if they seem like they're very oh, yeah. um, happy and go-to internally, they may be really revving it up. So, if the pathway itself is healthy, and I'm assuming it is, if you say that the cortisol is high, then yeah. something is going on. So, you really have to work with them on the their how they see things, how they worry, how they. You know, and you might want to take a look at their gut health also, um, speaking of that, because maybe their gut health isn't properly and they, it's producing more um, anxiety in them. So you have to look at how they're thinking, so their internal dialogue, how they're approaching, how they're handling stress, but also you want to take a look at their gut health because um, their microbiome could be, you know, not could be out of whack, right? So you could have bacteria you don't want in there. 
Um, it could also have not enough of the good bacteria in there. So now that's affecting their serotonin, dopamine, um, GABA, those neurotransmitters, which are going to also help balance their ability to handle stress and anxiety. Because if they don't have the stress and anxiety, their cortisol should go up and then it should fall back down. But if it's always up, then they've got some kind of stressor and it could be something internal. They could be eating really healthy food but still be having food sensitivity issues. Um, For instance, I had some real major trauma. Well, I don't know if I want to call it trauma, but very, very high stress a few years ago. And Mm -hmm. I do the food sensitivity on myself and I couldn't eat kale. I couldn't eat cauliflower. I couldn't eat any, the only green I could really eat was spinach. I was wow. reactive to everything. I was reactive to eggs. I was, you know, but that's because during that six month period of time, I was eating very well, but I was super stressed out. And, and so that created a food sensitivity to those items. Now I can eat them. Wow. But for wow. a while there, I had to back off of healthy foods um, that I had eaten a lot of in order to heal that so that I could then go back to eating them again. So sometimes you want to take a look at something that seems, you know, their diet might just seem absolutely fine, but they could have a food sensitivity. It would probably be more than one. I want to to back up a little bit to something you were saying about the gut mm -hmm. biome, uh, microbiome. Uh And I've had uh, somebody on the show talking about that before, but it was more in generalities how would you okay. determine if that's an issue and what would you do about it? Uh, well, I always assume two things. Uh, whether somebody has um, a physical condition, right, or yeah. a, an emotional condition. I always assume hormones and gut function are at play. Um, because they're just completely entwined. There's always a connection somewhere, even if it's just they don't have the digestive enzymes to get the nutrients in, right? There, there's always some some connection. Doesn't necessarily have to be severe leaky gut where they've got lots of food sensitivities. But what I would do is, I I test people with um, a test called the Dutch test, and this is. Um, a urine test that I do for broad spectrum hormones, but it also does some things where it's testing the CGIA or SIGA, sorry. Um, and it's, te- it's testing a few things that are going on in the gut as well. Um, also, if they're really low in melatonin, you know um, that it's really, it's dysfunctional. Um, I also do a gut a stool test so that I'm checking the bacteria to see if there's anything that's um, even good bacteria can be too much, right? It could be sure. overbalanced. Too much of a good thing. Too much is too much. Right. So I'll do a stool test to check for pathogens. I'll look for parasites, yeast, but I'm also looking for healthy, too much healthy bacteria as well as bad bacteria. And um, I do a, a permeability test. So you're using sugars, you're using small molecule sugars and large molecule sugars, and you're checking to see um, the permeability of the intestinal lining. And so all of that together will kind of give me a picture of what's going on with the gut health. Another test, though, that that's interesting to paint, like I said, this is why I go through the, the big health history. I don't want to give everything if I don't need to because they overlap a little. Right. But one of the tests that also is a good indicator of what's going on in the gut, believe it or not, is a neurofocus. So looking at neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are often, you know, produced in the brain, utilized by the brain, but they have a really heavy gut connection. And so if you're low with dopamines and serotonins, you're not getting them, then your gut's not functioning either. So if you're suspecting neurotransmitter stuff, you can just assume and you just support the gut. It's not going to, it's not going to hurt to support, you know, by giving, um, you know, intestinal lining support and just acting on a leaky gut even if you don't know for sure so you're just looking for indicators that indicate that there is gut dysfunction and working there but i always look for pathogens um, because if you don't address those then nothing's going to help 
So as far as your clientele, they would be somebody who suspects they're having a hormonal imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe their emotions are either erratic or extreme on one end or the other. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. they are feeling malaise, depressed. Uh, you know, we talked about the fibromyalgia symptoms. Is there anything mm -hmm. else that somebody listening might might say, hey, I wonder if Justine can help me? I don't know if there's anything specific that way. Um, you know, just that, that feeling of not feeling like yourself and you just don't really understand why. You know, just the malaise that you're talking about. It's... Um, there's so many things that when you go to your doctor, they seem really, really normal because everybody has them. <laughs> but the, the the truth of the matter is, is they're common. They're not normal. Yeah. Um, you know, women have menopause symptoms that could be pretty severe. But if everything was working in functioning order, you actually don't. The reason why your estrogens and progesterones are dropping is because you don't need them anymore. So you really shouldn't be experiencing, you know, heavy menopause symptoms. But it's such a joke in our, you know, we, we joke about it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. we, we talk about it. We are like, oh, these are killing me. And so everybody just thinks that that's com normal because it's so common. But it's actually not. I like that you said common is not the same as normal. And I think right. we kind of get lulled into a false sense of normality when we see something so often. I mean, we could talk about that mm -hmm. with politics, with food, with exercise, with our emotions. It, it really is an interesting thing uh, how mm -hmm. commonality can be reinterpreted as normal or even the new normal, right? Because things do change right. over time. Right, absolutely. Absolutely. How does somebody work with you? Do do they come to your office? Do they talk to you on the phone? Is this an online thing? So now I work exclusively online. Um, you know, I, I usually use a, a program called Zoom so that I can record it and we can share documents and, and I can share the screen and, and so forth so we can really walk through things. I used to have an office where people came in but um, because of my life today, I have to be a lot more mobile. Um, I have elderly parents myself, so I need to be a lot more mobile. And I've also realized that it's easier on my clients, even if they're just around the corner from me. They don't have to get dressed or do anything. It's a lot easier for them to get on the computer with me. And then as soon as we're off, they can go about their business. They don't have to drive and stuff. Yeah. So. I'm exclusively virtual now because of that. And I do, <laughs> I'll demonstrate exercises, I'll do all kinds of things, and it all works out just fine. I'll have them show me their fingernails or stick out their tongue if I need them to, or have take oh, a picture video. of something. Oh, video, you're, you're chatting with them on video yeah. so you can, you can see things. Yeah. What about all yeah. these tests that you run? Is this a mail thing? They, uh -huh. You send them yeah. a packet and they you know, do their thing and yes. send it in? Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, as FDN, um, as an FDNP, I work with a board of functional medicine doctors. So very, there's a lot of tests that I am authorized to not prescribe. I don't want to use that word, but I can order for my clients. Huh? Um, but everything is shipped to them. Uh, very rarely do I do a blood test. Um, sometimes they do, and then they just go to one of the lab corps or, you know, one of the, there's all these little lab outlets out around, and they can use, easily do those. But most of them they can just do in the house because they're going to be saliva, urine, stool samples um, for the most part. And you don't need to worry about chain of custody. Right. But occasionally there is a lab test that I feel is necessary, but I have doctors who can order it for me. So I just consult with them, and if they believe that's correct, then they'll take 
they'll order the test for me. So it, we're pretty thorough. And what's really nice is we're all about functional medicine. So it's not about testing lab results. It's really about the whole person all the way around. And so I, I'm blessed. Uh, it sounds like you're really doing a, a good deed for a lot of people. And I, I'm sure you're getting uh, compensated for that, which is my next question. Yet it is mm -hmm. still nice to know that this sort of service is available at, at all. Mm -hmm. Now, right. speaking of compensation, am I right in assuming mm -hmm. that insurance companies don't cover this? Um, they don't cover my services. Insurance companies have gotten kind of smart for a very short while. They did kind of start to cover health coaches, if you will. Yeah. Um, but what they started doing is hiring their own, and they're more like consult people. Um, so they don't cover people like myself or, or yourself, really, um, unless you're very lucky. There's so many insurance companies out there. I, you know, I wouldn't say for sure say that you couldn't them, yeah. do it. But um, some of the lab tests are covered. The, the difference, though, between myself um, ordering a lab for a client versus going to a doctor is very often doctors are constrained by insurance companies, though, on what they can order. And they don't really order things like, for instance, unless you very specifically ask for it or they think you've been out of the country, very rarely do they look for H. pylori. And yet, in my world, I find it maybe about 70% of the time. Holy cow. Um, yeah. It, and it's not about finding it because a person's traveled. It's because we all are traveling. I travel all the time. But what if I'm infected and 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 you and I share a meal or something, right? So it can be spread that way. If I took a bite off your plate off of uh, something you bit off of, it could be transmitted. Not, not always. So it's not that easily transmitted, but it's possible, right? So, mm -hmm. um, for instance, I have a client right now who had been suffering with acid reflux for well over five years, and just chronically ill, right? Chronic bronchitis, chronically ill. And when she came to me as her last hope because she had a cancer scare even, and we found H, H. pylori in her, and she's never been out of the country, right? So how did she get it? You know, it's not very prevalent here per se. Right. And, and so... It is. But it is, I think it's a little bit more common than people think it is. Um, and it can cause, but at the same time, if you have a really strong immune system, so this is some H. pylori, a little bit, can actually help your health. I know that sounds funny, but sometimes you need to, you know, have a little bit of dirt, right? A little stress on your immune system to make sure. yourself stronger. So even H. pylori, like when I first started learning about it, I thought, oh, boy, you don't want to go anywhere near it. But um, that's that's changed a little teeny bit. If it's not causing symptoms or anything, it's actually, and you've got a strong immune system, it's actually strengthening your immune system, and it can actually do some other things that are pretty good. Nice. But um, good when it's overblown, right, when it's out of control, then it can cause a, a lot of damage to your uh, stomach lining and stuff like that and, and it yes. can interfere with your gallbladder and and other things and so you know and, and gallbladders are one of the things that get taken out pretty quickly which is frightening to me and oh yeah all the um, time I'm constantly I'm not every not every day maybe not even every week but unbelievably often am I hearing about gallbladders being removed and going to be removed and that sort of thing well, Justine, this has been truly fascinating. Um, the hormones are a really interesting world, and I don't think that they really get enough uh, respect or value as far as being the cause of a lot of people's, um, I'll, I'll just say the broad uh, umbrella of illnesses. Mm -hmm. How can somebody get a hold of you? They can go to my website, 
uh, justinececile.com or they can email me at services at justinececile.com. Either way. And I will, of course, have those on my show notes page on livefitpodcast.com. Thank you. And, and I do have a freebie. It's just a PDF. It's about how to calm yourself oh, if nice. you need to. I, I'm just going to say this really quick because a lot of people might read it and think, oh, this is kind of silly, but they actually really work. Um, there's a neuroscience basis to each of them, and they help you change your chemistry if you do them, but they, they do require practice. So I just want everybody to understand that you can't just pull them out of the hat when you need them. Uh -huh. You need to practice them on small things yeah. um, and gain confidence in the fact that they work so that your brain will actually work with them. I do a lot of neuroscience behind my coaching methods yeah. because I'm working with the body and how the brain works with the body in order to do things. And so all of stuff. these are really, really simple, but they do take a little bit of practicing um, in order to be able to use them and to use them really effectively, but they do work very, very well. That's fantastic. Good stuff to know. And Justine, I may have missed it when you were giving your introduction, um, but I wasn't able to find that uh -huh. on your website. What's your education? How did you get to be an expert in the hormones? Did you did you give all that at the beginning? Uh, well, we kind of got caught up with Gitmo, I guess, oh. and, and we started talking about that. But well, Justine, yes. thank you very much for all of your knowledge. I'm going to, once again, have your information on my show notes page. If you could send me uh, okay. any information you want me to include on that page, I I've got your about from your website. If you have any okay. you know, updated photos or any images you want me to share, that would be great as well. Is there anything else? Uh, no, just thank you. Um, you know, it was a lot of fun and it and it, talking with you. I I enjoy talking to other professionals about this stuff and uh, you know some of the things that you're saying. Again, like the exercise, I'm so glad to hear you say that because exercise is one of those things everybody pushes too hard for. And they always think and, the more um, the better. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And um, that just causes more stress. It does. Right. It does. <laughs> so we. So. Um, we don't want to do that. So I'm just really glad to have had the opportunity to talk with you. I really enjoyed it. And um, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Live Fit Podcast. Please subscribe and share with someone you care about. Read show notes, articles, resources, and learn more about our weight management programs at livefitpodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening and always remember to live fit.